Today I want to talk about how to taste whiskey. Now I know a lot of you out there are going to be saying how to taste whiskey. I'm pretty sure I know how to do that. I've been doing it for a lot of years and you're absolutely right. If you are enjoying whiskey and you're drinking it in moderation, not doing any harm to yourself or others, then you are absolutely drinking whiskey the right way because the important thing is that you're not harming anyone and you're getting something out of it. But there are definitely certain things that we can all do to enhance our enjoyment and experience of whiskey and make sure that we get the most out of them that we possibly can. Now I'm going to start with the very basics which is the details of how to actually take a whiskey that's in a bottle and get some enjoyment out of it. So this is going to be teaching a lot of you to suck eggs but bear with me. So glassware is probably the most important thing you can do to maximize your enjoyment of whiskey and I am working on a separate video for glassware but the long and the short of it if you have something that looks roughly like this small tulip shaped glass then you're probably mostly on the right track also incredibly important when you're tasting whiskey is the temperature now most of us would agree that room temperature or thereabouts is the right temperature to really appreciate the flavors of whiskey and that's not to say that everyone that drinks whiskey on the rocks or keeps a bottle of whiskey in the refrigerator is doing it wrong but it must be said that if you are chilling your whiskey in any way you are muting those flavors you are getting less flavors and if it's some of your cheaper blended stuff that might be what you're going for but it's important to be aware that by chilling a whiskey you are getting less flavor than you could do on the theme of making sure that you get all of the flavor and experience that you can it's incredibly important when you're drinking whiskey to have a distraction free environment so you don't want any audio or visual distractions if at all possible but also you don't want any distractions on your palate itself so Ideally, you don't want to be tasting a whiskey after you've had a meal consisting of strong flavours, anything that lingers on your palate, or especially if you've burnt your tongue on a hot drink, anything like that is definitely a no-no if you really want to appreciate your whiskey. Another distraction that a lot of people don't take into consideration is olfactory distractions. Now, that's distractions that come in through your nose. So, especially in the bad old days when people are allowed to smoke in pubs, if you were sitting next to someone that was smoking a big old cigar, then the chances that you're going to pick out the finer notes on your grain whiskey or your delicate Speyside single malt were very slim. Luckily we don't have that problem anymore, so if you are drinking in a, a pub or a bar then you stand a much better chance of having a good experience. But just bear in mind that when you're drinking your whiskey at home, maybe lay off the heavy aftershave and maybe don't conduct your tasting sessions in the kitchen after you've cooked a meal. Now this last point about the technical side of actually drinking whiskey is something that divides a lot of people and it's something that I'm still a little bit on the fence about and that's chewing whiskey. And I must admit that myself included if you go to a bar or a pub and you get your whiskey usually not in a glass anything like this but you get your whiskey and you take a little sip and you're tempted to chew it a little bit move it around your mouth you feel like a little bit of a tit <laughs> it's not something that is a particularly enjoyable experience when you're in polite company a lot of people really frown upon it and to a lot of people it makes you seem kind of pompous but it must be said that chewing whiskey, just moving it around your mouth, not necessarily actually moving your jaw to chew it, although some people do do that and they do find that it helps them, but moving it around your mouth and more importantly holding it on your tongue is definitely something that can improve the experience and get some extra flavours. I think the key thing that I'm going to say here is experiment with different things, try chewing it, try moving it around, holding it for different amounts of time and do what works for you. But what I would definitely recommend is when you're tasting whiskey, take smaller sips and hold them on your tongue for longer. I feel that that is the way, especially if you hold them on your tongue long enough that it starts to mix with your saliva and dilute a little bit and really spread over your tongue. That is definitely a way that you can improve the experience and get more out of your single malt. Now that we've actually got the, the technicalities, the actual mechanical process of tasting whiskey out of the way, I want to introduce you to my five point plan on how to taste, appreciate and become familiar with whiskey. Now this is going to be especially helpful for beginners hopefully, but probably going to be some things in there that will be helpful for anyone. Now my number one point on my plan for appreciating whiskey is to taste lots and lots of whiskey. 
And you can do this in lots of ways, and my favourite one is by buying samples. There's lots of websites out there, especially if you're fortunate enough to live in the UK at least, where you can buy 30 or 50 or sometimes even 60 millilitres samples of whiskey. Now, I've said before that I don't necessarily recommend trying miniatures, because I do think that sometimes they can be a little bit curated and not representative of what you buy in the actual bottle. But anywhere that's not associated to the distillery itself that sells miniatures is an absolute godsend for anyone out there who's trying to try a wide range of whiskey as quickly and cheaply as possible. It means that you can try things that are very expensive for a much smaller initial outlay to see what you like. And more importantly, it means that if you buy a sample of something that you absolutely hate, you don't get stuck with a whole bottle of it. Another way to try lots of whiskies that I've hinted at already is going to bars, pubs and even restaurants. Now if you're lucky to have a well stocked whisky bar anywhere near you, that's a great way to try a lot of whiskies. What I will say is you tend to be a little bit more limited when it comes to whis even whisky bars compared to buying samples online. But especially if you're starting out, a trip to a whisky bar that has not just your basic range of blends and one or two sort of 10, 12 year old single malts is a really, really good way to try a wide range of stuff relatively easily. Another downside to that is obviously that most of the time you will be sharing that space with the general public, so you can't always control how noisy or stinky or irritating your dining partners can be. And lastly, another way to try lots of different whiskies, if you're fortunate enough to know other people who share your enthusiasm for whiskies, then see if you can club together, buy a bottle and share it out amongst yourselves that can also be a great way to try lots of different whiskies at a reduced price and it also gives you the advantage of if they're on a similar level to you that you've got other people to pick out tasting notes that may or may not agree with your own notes and that can be an excellent way to learn. Point number two on my five point plan is to take notes, lots and lots of notes. Even if it's something that you've tasted a million times before, take notes because you never know when that whiskey is going to go out of production or it could be that your palate changes, or maybe the, the makeup of the vatting changes, and the whiskey is nothing like it used to be. Now, there's going to be a lot of people out there that think that taking notes is a little bit excessive, it's a little bit of a step too far, and I would say that if you're really enthusiastic about your love for whiskey of any kind, you'll probably regret that attitude eventually. Now, me personally, I've been taking notes for about 10 years now, so I've got a lot of notes that I can look back at. And I was probably enjoying whiskey for probably five, nearly 10 years before that. And even myself, having taken notes for the last 10 years, there are certain whiskies that I tried very early in my journey that I just wish I'd made some more complete notes of. Another thing that can put people off is, especially if you're a beginner, it might seem like you try a whiskey and you don't pick out that many flavours. Maybe you're not accustomed to it yet. You're not quite got the hang of it. And that can be off-putting to some people when they write notes. I would say, don't worry about that. Persevere and put down what you do find. And in years to come, you can come back and look back on those notes. And you might find that your palate has changed enormously. Or it might just be that your ability to pick out the notes has improved drastically. And you can compare what you could see back then with what you can see now. I'd also say if you're retasting a whiskey, keep the old notes and the new notes separate so you can see any differences in the different vattings that you've had. Now, what I just said about if, you, if you're if you a beginner especially and you try a whiskey and you're not really finding anything in it to write down, that links nicely into my point number three out of my five point plan, and that's don't invent tasting notes. If you taste a whiskey and you're not finding much, if you can't find anything at all, you literally can't taste anything, put that. Put that it's bland, that it's indeterminate, that there's no standout flavours. Because not having a flavour at all, that is a tasting note. But what you absolutely shouldn't do is invent things. And that goes for when you read or listen to someone else's tasting notes or the worst offender out of all in my experience is the tasting notes that some whiskies especially lower tier whiskies can put on the label or the box now i think that those tasting notes are almost always absolutely useless i don't know who they get to write them but i'm 
sure that it's someone in marketing rather than someone that actually appreciates whiskey. So if you're tasting whiskey and someone else says that they're tasting almonds or butterscotch and you just don't get that, I would be very wary about writing that down because of peer pressure, because you feel like it should be in there, rather than it's something that you can actually taste. Because if you put lots of things in tasting notes that you haven't experienced yourself, that's not a good way for you to grow and develop your palate and your tasting abilities. Now, talking about this, it reminds me of uh, a video that I watched fairly recently of someone tasting Johnny Walker Black Label. Now, Johnny Walker Black Label, it's, it's an icon of the whiskey world. And I don't wish that it would disappear at all. But listening to the tasting notes that this person was getting out of Johnny Walker Black Label, I was just thinking, I'm not getting that at all. <laughs> when I taste Johnny Walker Black Label, there's a little bit of pea, a little bit of maltiness. But in my opinion, it's really quite a sparse, featureless whiskey. And I do think that it's important that especially people that are new to the whiskey world are aware of that. A lot of your bottom tier whiskies, a lot of people will taste a whiskey and say, I'm no good at tasting whiskey because I taste it and it just tastes like whiskey. Well, that may be down to what you're drinking rather than your tasting abilities. Because, in my opinion, a lot of the the over-blended, mass-marketed whiskies, and I'm talking about things even lower tier than Johnny Walker Black Label, they kind of do just taste like whiskey. If you're really going for the, the low price point whiskies, now there's some gems in there, but a lot of them don't have the sort of flavours that you really want to be looking for and picking out. And that can really stump some beginners. Point number four on my five point plan is beware of experts. <laughs> beware of whiskey experts, because who in their right mind would trust anyone that goes on the internet and tells you about whiskey? <laughs> in my opinion, there isn't really such a thing as a whiskey expert. There are only people that are more or less experienced with whiskey. If you met someone that said that they ate a hundred sandwiches every day, would you say that that person was a sandwich expert? Probably not. And I'd say the same sentiment probably extends to people that call them whiskey experts or sommeliers or whatever they want to call it. Tasting whiskey is an inherently subjective experience, and that's one of the th many things that makes it so great. Because I can taste this whiskey, and I can tell you what it tastes like to me, I can tell you the, the science behind it. But if you taste it, and you taste something completely different, then what good are my tasting notes, really? And more importantly, who would I be to say that what you taste is incorrect? Even worse than that, when people give a whiskey a grade and they insist that it's either the best or the worst whiskey in the world, it's really irrelevant when you consider that everyone has different tastes and preferences, and what might be really enjoyable to someone might be middling or borderline offensive to someone else. As with anything that a lot of people care about, there's a lot of snobbery that comes with the whiskey world, and that's definitely something you don't want to get tangled up in. I'd say the more important thing when you're looking for people whose opinions you might be able to trust when it comes to whiskey is to look for people that have reviewed whiskies that you've also had yourself and see if their notes tie up to what you experience. Because everyone's palate is different and if you can find someone who tastes a whiskey and spots the same things and identifies flavours that you can identify and produces tasting notes that are meaningful to you, then there's a higher chance that when you read one of their reviews or watch one of their reviews about a new whiskey, there's a higher chance that their tasting notes are going to be useful to you. Now, bullet point number five is going to come full circle and link back into bullet point number one. Bullet point number one was taste lots of whiskey, as much whiskey as you can. Bullet point number five is don't taste lots of whiskey. And by that, I mean, don't get blinkered and narrow minded. Don't think that whiskey or single malt whiskey or peated whiskey is the only thing in the world and the only thing that you should experience. Taste as much as you can and taste as many different things as you can. Taste wine, taste cherry, especially Fino and Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso, the ones that are used widely in the whiskey industry for finishing and maturation. Taste bourbon, taste rye, taste grappa, gin, taste pickled cabbage, taste Brussels sprouts, taste basil, nutmeg, taste everything. Because the more things that you taste, the more things that you experience, 
even if it's something that you hate, even if it turns out to be something that doesn't come up in the world of whiskey at all, it's all experience and it all adds to your flavour map and it all adds to the list of things that you can draw on from memory and specify in tasting notes if you do ever come up against them in the whiskey world. Now, I think that is just about the end of my five-point plan on how to get the most out of whiskey. So anyone that just came for the list and the broad strokes, they can probably leave now because I'm about to look at some specific examples and get into some more rather geeky stuff. I might split this video into two parts, might end it here and split it into another video. I might not, we'll have to see how that goes. But this here is something that I've been drinking regularly and it's something that I think is an absolutely superb thing for any whiskey drinker to try and track down to enhance their experience and tasting ability. Hopefully you can see the label there, hopefully that's in focus. This is actually a bottle of Manzanilla Sherry and this is one that I purchased from M&S for anyone that's interested. You can get Manzanilla from just about anywhere that sells decent wines and fortified wines. This one is an M&S bottling. And I think I would say that when you buy from M&S, you don't always get superb quality. You tend to get more upper level bottlings, but there's also a few dogs in there as well. And it's not always price dependent. But I thought I'd mention where this one came from because some people will probably want to know and you can fairly easily find out where this is from by a little bit of Googling. But as I said, this is a Manzanilla Extra Dry and Light Sherry. And a few of the eagle-eyed of you out there will be able to see that there's quite a bit of condensation on the bottle and the labels actually start to dissolve a little bit from that condensation because Manzanilla, along with a lot of the, the drier, paler sherries. It's quite common for people to serve them not cold, but slightly chilled. So I've had this one in the fridge for a little bit. So for everyone that stayed for the geeky stuff, let's get some in the glass. So it is a screw top, which I'm not thrilled about. But wine is becoming a little bit pro progressive these days. They are becoming more open to a screw top. And as long as you drink it fairly quickly, which you definitely should with the, the paler, more delicate sherries, probably doesn't matter too much. So Manzanilla, not Manzanilla, not that pronunciation matters too much, is a Spanish fortified wine. And Manzanilla is actually a type of fino sherry. So just like all fino sherries, it's a fortified wine made from grapes and matured under a yeast floor in a wooden cask. And just like all fino sherry, it has little to no sugar content in the finished product. So this is going to be a somewhat dry form of sherry. And me personally, as well as I think a lot of people have this opinion, that I think that the, the drier sherries tend to have that little bit more going on with them. There's just a little bit more character a little bit more complexity and me personally I appreciate a sweet sherry as well as I appreciate port if I'm going for something really sweet but that's more of an occasional thing for me if I'm going for a sherry I would tend to go for something a little bit drier like this and you might have just seen that I changed my grip on the glass from my usual whiskey warming grip to holding the bottom there because something like this I don't want to put too much warmth into the sherry before I get around to tasting it Another interesting little bit of trivia, manzanilla is actually the Spanish term for chamomile. And the reason for that is manzanilla sherry is named after chamomile because the people that first made it thought that it had some taste similarities with like a, a chamomile infused wine or chamomile tea, those similar sort of flavours, which is a little bit bizarre when you consider that the word chamomile comes from the Greek for fallen apple. So it's named after something that's named after apples even though this is made from grapes anyway i think that's plenty confusion for now considering we haven't even had any alcohol lit yet let's get some tasting and nosing notes so the nose of this one is definitely very different to your pedro jimenez your really sweet cloying darker sherries there's a little bit of a, a rubberiness to the nose on this one. Some rubbery grape whiny notes. 
going to say that there is a hint of sweetness to this one. A little bit of a perfumed grape note and a little bit of a, a Turkish delight perfumed jelly confectionery note, but obviously being a dry sherry, there is a, a dry, almost salty edge to the grape notes on this one. Let's see how it tastes. Definitely more of that rubbery grape note and definitely quite, really quite dry, slightly acetic. So this is a very good manzanilla in my opinion, but there is a slight dry vinegar acetic note to this one, but not enough. It doesn't taste like vinegar. It's a very pleasant note. It's just, but it's definitely got a sharp acidic note that goes all the way through. I also think there's a little bit of a, a fatty oiliness to this one. Slight note of stone fruits, a little bit of a mineral quality, and a little bit of a, a grappa grape must note. So anyone that's had grappa, that's a distilled spirit that's made from the, the leftover grape musts after they press it into wine. So again, that's another very dry, astringent, musty, hard, brittle note. But the dryness on this one, I can see this one being an amazing palate cleanser, if nothing else. As well as a great accompaniment to anything like tapas, like olives or nuts or something like that. I'm not sure, and I'm not a great believer in drinking wine or whiskey alongside food, but I think that this one would be a really good one to have alongside some savoury snacks. More importantly though, I get lots of notes in this one that are similar to the sort of notes that you get in a Chardonnay or Fino cask finished whiskey, especially that rubbery grape notes and the, the fattiness and the oiliness and a little bit of the meatiness on the finish. These are all things that you can taste directly when you taste a whiskey that's been finished in a very dry sherry or dry white wine cask. Now, one of the things that I find really interesting about tasting this as a whiskey drinker, whiskey, scotch whiskey really is my thing. It's what I'm passionate about and it's what I've tasted most of. But when I taste this, one of the things that really threw me was when I first tried it, I thought there's definitely a, a grape sweetness about this one. And then I thought, but it's also a very dry type of sherry because on the one hand, by definition as a, a type of fino sherry, there is little, literally little to no sugar content in this sherry. So by definition, there shouldn't be much sweetness to this at all. So I was tempted to say, no, that actually that's an incorrect tasting note. I was tempted to cross that out. But you taste it again and you think, well, there definitely is a sweet component to it, even though it's mostly dry. That grape note, would it be identifiable as grape if it didn't have at least some sweetness to it? And that really made me start to consider what is sweet? What defines sweetness as a flavour? sort of got me thinking that there are more than there is more than one way to define sweetness there's more than one type of sweetness and I think that also when you start tasting things like this if you are a little bit narrow-minded and I think most of us are we have our things that we like and we tend to stick to them but when you taste things that are a little bit out of your comfort zone it makes you start to realize that a lot of tasting notes are relative and therefore at least partly subjective and I think just realising that, realising the, the breadth of experience and how different things are different in different ways, it's all very useful to you when you're tasting whiskey. So as much as I really like this one, I'm going to clear the decks on this one because I want to make way for something else. What would I give this one as a grade? I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I'm not a wine critic. I don't feel that it would be useful at all to give any sort of grade to this, but I'm just going to say that I really like this one. Really good pale sherry. So our next oddball bottling, I'll hold this one up to the camera as well. Hopefully you can get focus on that label because that's an absolutely beautiful label. Now, I can't actually remember where I got this from, but I don't think that it's bottled for any particular supermarket or brand. But that beautiful Art Deco label kind of reminds you a little bit of Compass Box, but really in the whiskey world, 
there's really not many things, not many whiskey brands that go to that level of beauty in their labels. Now, many of you will have realised from the giant letters on the front top of the label there, this is a masala wine. And as a Brit, I will share some of your disappointment when I say that this is not curry flavoured. <laughs> Masala is another variety of fortified wine, this time it's from Italy. And again, Masala is actually another protected designation of origin product. So whereas the, the Manzanilla can only be grown in one region of Andalusia, this one can only be produced in one region of Sicily. And in my opinion, a lot of the best wines and fortified wines that you'll find anywhere are produced in Italy. There was a time when myself, like a lot of you, probably thought that wine was just a little bit lacking like I've always appreciated beer and I've always absolutely loved whiskey as an almost sacred experience but wine it's just in that middle ground and I thought it's not really got enough flavors to make it it's that sort of god tier that you get from whiskey but it's not as refreshing as a beer but I think something that really changed my mind on that was when I got some really good Italian Chiantis and Barolos and if you can find some of those big, heavy-hitting, full-bodied red wines from Italy, especially a good Barolo, that can really be a little bit of an eye-opener. Anyway, this is not a Barolo or a Chianti. This is a Masala from Sicily, which is a fortified wine from the Masala region of Sicily. And Masala wine can be sweet or dry. This one is Masala Secco, which is Italian for dry. So... Whereas you can get both dry and sweet varieties of masala. Me being me, I've gone for the dry variety of the two. Now, masala, not even being a sherry and not from Spain, things work a little bit differently over there. Now, seco masala can actually be quite a lot sweeter than an equiv or what should be an equivalent dry sherry. You can have up to around 40 grams of sugar per litre in a dry masala wine, which is qu it can be quite a lot. And the other categories of masala for anyone that's interested, you get semi-seco, which is above 40 grams of sugar per litre. And then beyond that, you get sweet masala wine or dulce masala wine, which is around about on par with like your Pedro Jimenez and your pale cream sherries in terms of sugar content. So let's get some of this in the glass and see what we've got with this one. Some of the eagle eyed out there may have noticed that the label on this one is dry because, in my opinion, a masala wine, even though it's a relatively dry masala wine, it's much more of a, a sweeter, full bodied experience, and it's something that I would more serve at room temperature. This one, it's also worth noting that because the, the alcohol content and how this is produced is that bit different to the, the Manzanilla, this one will keep that little bit longer. As for the age of these, it's always, when you're a, a whiskey geek, it's always hard to get over the idea of aging these things. It does say five Annie, five years on the label of this one, which is probably, I don't think they say, but I think it's probably around... The same age as the Manzanilla. That's a fairly typical dry fino sherry age. So this masala wine from Sicily, you can see that the colour is certainly very different. So the colour there, if our whiskey producers are honest, that's the sort of colour that might come through in a masala wine finished whiskey, providing they're not adding any E150A spirit caramel. So on the nose of the masala wine. So even though they are both dry, fortified wines, this is enormously different to the Manzanilla. It's much closer to a Pedro Jimenez or a very sweet Oloroso sherry. But saying that, it's not that dense, one-dimensional sweetness that you get from a lot of PX sherry. I would say that the thing I get most from the nose on this one is cranberry. And that really highlights perfectly that balance between sweet and dry because cranberries are definitely sweet. Even unsweetened cranberries have a sweetness to them. But obviously anyone that's had a glass of unsweetened cranberry juice will tell you that they're also really quite astringent and dry. 
So lots of cranberry on the nose of this one. Sweet grapes. Lots of sweet figs. So not fresh figs. Figs when they're starting to go a little bit mushy and dark when you really get that sugary fig quality. Yeah, definitely sweet, but with that astringent cranberry note. Also, and I, f I felt like I'm going a little bit mad with this one, but ever so often I get this little note of egg white on the nose of this. A little bit of an egg white wet dog note. Also getting raisins and a little note of almond nutty marzipan. It's actually surprised me quite a lot there, the, the complexity of the, the notes just on the nose. I must admit that normally when I taste wine, I do almost always think that it's a simpler experience, a simpler drink than whiskey, but this one's really rather complex. Let's see how it tastes. So again, on the palate of this one, lots of rich, sweet, juicy raisins and figs, but it's backed up perfectly by a lovely sour juiciness. So again, it's got quite a bit of sweetness and also a little bit of a, a rubbery grape note that's similar to what I got on the manzanilla. So it's, it's sweet, but with a sour and dry backbone to it. It's going to have one more sip and look at the finish. Quite a meatiness, meatiness and a nuttiness to the, the finish, the late palate and finish on this Masala wine. Also getting a little bit of a, a hint of earthy mushroom. So a very complex, very well-made drink here with the Masala wine, as well as the, the Manzanilla, but especially on the Masala wine. The notes that I'm getting on the palate and finish, they're notes that I would say that you have in common with a lot of whiskies matured in dry sherry casks, especially that nutty meatiness and the mushroom quality that really reminds me of something like a, a Mortluck. So those distilleries that either finish or preferably mature their whiskies in the really dry, funky sherry casks that pick up that meatiness and mushroom and earthiness. That's definitely something that transfers into whiskey. And it's really interesting to taste that sort of thing in this Masala wine, because you can then really see where that flavor comes from when you taste it in whiskey. So it'd be almost rude not to, out of these two, the Manzanilla and the Masala wine, which one do I prefer? I'm not going to give either a grade, and I don't think I can really choose between the two. This one is really much more light and delicate, in a way more playful, maybe slightly more complex. In a way, this one is more delicate and playful, whereas this one it's maybe loses a little bit of complexity for that extra sweetness that it has, but it also picks up a little bit more body, and I must say, really surprised by the complexity on this one as well. So what else would I recommend for people that are looking to broaden their horizons and maybe even expand their whiskey palette? Well, definitely the different types of sherry. It's really helpful for anyone that appreciates whiskey to be familiar with bourbon, as well as the, the sweet sherries like the sweet Oloroso and the Pedro Jimenez, as well as the, the drier sherries like the, the Manzanilla, Fino, Amontillado. It's definitely helpful if you're familiar with those. Red wines, Chianti, Masala. But really, don't limit yourself to anything. I'd even go as far as saying that trying things like grappa, rum, mead, soshu and rice wine, things like that, they're all things that can teach you something. They're all experiences that are worth having. Even something like grappa, absinthe, perno, even ouzo, they're all things that you should have in your, your tasting note repertoire, things that you can use to define flavours in future. And something that I've definitely mentioned in the past, things like some of the more craft presentations of tequila and mezcal, those are things that a lot of scotch drinkers will probably be completely unaware of that can really give you a new perspective, especially on some of the more smoky scotch whiskies, because some of those craft mezcals do have quite a bit of a smoky punch to them. So I think that's about all I have to say here, and I hope you've enjoyed going through this with me, and I look forward to hearing from you in the comments and hearing what oddballs you have had in your tasting experience that's really opened your eyes. So thanks for joining me, and cheers.